Hey friends, it's Dr. Amy, and I am really excited here to have a new friend and colleague talk with us today about co-parenting and the processes that we go through. So let me introduce my special guest today. Her name is Arisha Smolarski. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified in co-parenting. She's a mediator, a mother, and she has a clinical practice in Los Angeles. She is the author of co Cooperative Co-Parenting for Secure Kids, the Attachment Theory Guide to Raising Kids in Two Homes. She specializes in working with co-parents, couples, and individuals. As a co-parent herself, she's very familiar with the challenges faced by parents raising kids in two households. For more than 10 years, she has drawn on attachment theory and other modalities to help clients move from conflict to cooperation, make child-centered agreements, and create a secure co-parenting to family system. She lives with her daughter and her cat and sees clients both virtually and in person. And I will put all things about Arisha in our uh, show notes so that you can link up to her and find out more about her and her book. Um, But welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much, Amy. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to have you here too. And I know my listeners will really appreciate this information. I had the pleasure of reading your book and it is in alignment with everything we teach on this podcast about the por- the importance of relationship and connection. Um, but before we dive in to the book, um, is there anything else you want to share p- with people about who you are or what you're up to in the world right now? Well, I'd like to share a little bit of how I even got into this, right? Great. Like, how did I get to writing this book? Because I feel like, you know, as I tell this story, I feel like it resonates with other co-parents. Um, so I just, you know, at the beginning of our relationship, my co-parent and I, this relationship was full of uh, stress and conflict. It was a mess, of course. And I think a lot of co-parents can relate to that, right? You've never done this before. Here you are embarking on this new type of relationship that's full of challenges and um, unique situations. And um, and I could see that my daughter was in distress. I mean, I remember that day as if it was yesterday walking into the kitchen and there she was, her head down. And I saw a little tear trickling down her, her cheek. And I was like, you know, knelt down in front of her and asked like, what's, what's up, baby? How are you doing? And uh, she looked up at me and said, I feel all alone in the woods. Mm. And that was the wake up call to get me out of my emotional stupor that I was in. I mean, of course I was struggling with anger and sadness and fear, fear of like being alone and what is this gonna do to my kid? And, And the shame of, you know, what does this mean about me now? Here I was a relationship therapist and I couldn't keep my own relationship together. And then there was that cultural shame that I think a lot of people don't talk about, but this narrative that divorce is bad, that it's a failure, that it's not normal. And I could see my daughter kind of struggling with that as well. And I think a lot of children struggle with that and they take that into their home, their schools with them, right? Like they don't want to talk about the divorce. They don't want to share that their parents are, that they live in two homes. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you know, that wake up call kind of made me think about all that and how it was so important for me to refocus, you know, what was really important and get back to kind of making sure that my daughter felt secure in the world. Um, And she needed her dad and me to work together. And so I was like, okay, what do I, how can I do this? Because, you know, this is a co-parenting relationship is still just as valid a relationship as a marriage or dating. And So I, you know, went on, you know, a journey to look for resources that would help me be in this kind of relationship, not just what to do and what not to do, but how. And I came up short. I was a little disappointed. There really wasn't a lot of material out there that felt uh, helpful to me. So I turned towards what I knew about relationships um, and relationship principles and attachment theory. And I started to apply that to my own co-parenting relationship and it started to work. And we soon were able to move from conflict to cooperation, to gain more clarity and consistency within our two home family system. And that, you know, at the same time, I saw that my daughter was able to adjust and get back into her thriving and happy self. And so, you know, with a lot of encouragement and positive feedback from colleagues um, and friends who were like, what's your secret? You should write this down. I decided to um, write this book because through my research, I realized that it wasn't the divorce itself that hurts kids. 
it's how we do divorce. Mm -hmm. So if I needed this information, probably a lot of other co-parents need this information as well. And so in the book, you know, I help co-parents understand what's going on within their own emotional landscape that sometimes people don't realize if they're not in therapy, but they need the information to help them heal and grow. So they don't bring that into their co-parenting relationship. Mm -hmm. They can really separate that out. And also understanding how our attachment styles, you know, are playing out within that dynamic so that co-parents can learn more, you know, uh, healthier communication patterns and really do what they want to do is, you know, create effective and child-centered agreements. This way, the child does not have to take on the burdens of the divorce and they can be free to be kids. So that's my hope with the book. And that's a you know, long story, but how I got here today and where my passion is, is really about helping families create secure kids, even amidst adversity. This is so in line with um, the work I do about trauma and mm-hmm. children and creating hope around trauma. So um, many of my listeners will be familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study that was done in 1998 by Kaiser Permanente and the CDC. And divorce was listed among the top 10 most traumatic things that a child can experience. Now, since then, there have been additions. This is just for my listeners' um, purview as well. There have been additions to those Adverse Childhood Experiences. And we know there are many things that are traumatic in addition to these 10 adverse childhood experiences or ACEs as they're called. Um, But divorce was among the top 10. It was the most highly endorsed adverse childhood experience as well, because divorce, as we know, is common. But I am with you, Arisha, that divorce does not have to be traumatic for a child. In fact, it shouldn't be traumatic for a child if we as adults are regulated. So Let's break down just a little bit some of what you said, because you said a lot and it felt re- really reassuring, but let's let's break some of it down. First, you talked about the adult emotional landscape. Mm-hmm. Can you just say a little bit more for even well-intentioned, incredible adults that are out there? That's a, that's what, that's a big therapeutic word. What do you mean by that? So what happens what I find what happens during any crisis. So it could be a fight between Mm -hmm. uh, people who are together. It can be this, you know, crisis, a trauma where there is a huge separation. Um, And the way that I talk about it in my book is really through the lens of attachment theory. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can back up a little bit and, and, and explain that. Um, And then to describe what I found happens with co-parents who are moving from, you know, being married together. So, um, you know, a lot of you who are listening probably are aware of what attachment science is already, but in a nutshell, you know, it's this innate biological drive for a child to um, bond and seek emotional attunement and protection and safety and security from their um, primary caregiver who is their um, attachment figure. And depending on how consistent and reliable and um, emotionally attuned this and available this caregiver is the child's going to create these adaptive strategies, um, which will then in order to, you know, maintain safety and to survive these adaptive strategies, these adaptive strategies then follow children into their adult relationships. And those become, you know, patterns of behavior. Mm -hmm. What I find, you know, that happens at that moment of separation is exactly the thing that triggers the attachment system to go onto high gear, to mm-hmm. seek, you know, attunement and, and, and soothing and, you know, um, meet my needs, all those things that happen. Right. And so the, the parents, you know, the, the adult relationship, um, the romantic relationship basically is now your attachment system. When that is severed or is, you know, in this crisis of divorced and is now in a state of separation, those attachment cables have nowhere to go. All of your old attack, your old um, wounding and traumas around being alone or uh, abandonment or rejection or un- feeling unworthy. Um, or the shame of, you know, not being good enough, or, you know, all of that gets 
activated and triggered during this high stress crisis moment. And the person who you used to go to is no longer the person to be your attachment figure. And so I find that this is underneath a lot of the conflict is, um, you know, this confusion and a need to kind of assert your own sense of worthiness and being in control because being a failure just is not something that a lot of people can sit with. And that's what I'm saying, like this whole idea of failure um, perpetuates that. And so when co-parents can understand and see that these emotional cables are still attached and connected to their ex and instead learn to unplug those from that person who no longer holds the role of attachment figure mm -hmm. and learn to plug them back into themselves and do the healing work they need to do and to you know bring compassion and to you know understand that their feelings are valid but that it's no longer their ex to meet that mm -hmm. and that can be so liberating and empowering to people and to help them really separate out their emotions from the dynamic that's happening um, between them now, which is just about co-parenting. It's just solely about parenting. And um, yeah. so that can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to just reiterate something really important because you're talking about the attachment cables for adults, right? Mm -hmm. That we have to our significant other and kind of finding a new center for them. And not surprising to any of my listeners, the answer will always be starting with ourselves, right? right? Um, that whether you are a parent or co-parent, um, whether you are a pediatrician, whether you are a teacher walking into a classroom, if you don't have a sense of regulation with yourself, if you are not connected with yourself, how are you going to co-regulate with anyone else? students, your child, your ex, um, your patients, whomever it might be. So I love this idea of kind of taking those attachment cables and I'm imagining in my head, um, these like, they can either be like ripped out and torn apart and right, flying all over the place and frayed, or they can be kind of unplugged gently mm -hmm. and plugged back in to me. Right. So so that kind of came from that question about that adult emotional landscape, right? Really being aware that we are separating from this person. And then the the other thing that you said that really sat with me is um, this idea of a child holding the burden of divorce. Yeah. Um, can you say a little bit more? I think we can all feel that. Mm -hmm. But can you say a little bit more about what that might mean for a toddler versus a 12 year old versus a teenager? Like how might they experience that burden in really kind of practical scenario ways? Well, I think, I mean, yeah, as you mentioned, different ch children at different ages are going to feel it differently, but overall, I think the idea of a burden, right. Are, is um, when a child is left alone to navigate the challenges of divorce they're going to struggle a lot more. And so I think about this as, and, that, and that's what actually causes trauma is when they, they feel like they don't have a present calm and attuned connected caregiver to help them understand what's going on, um, help them answer questions in a neutral way, um, help them, you know, be present and become aware of their own emotions and needs and feel like that they are able to actually express them without having to placate one of their parents or without having to be stuck in the middle or be a messenger or lose one of their parents in the mix, you know, in the, in the process or, you know, all of those create these burdens. Um, and I use, and this is like a pretty common um, analogy that people use is this emotional backpack where children, you know, if they don't feel safe to be able to express their emotions, their needs, um, they will shove them into this backpack. And that then becomes this burden that they have to carry with them throughout their lives. Um, and they, what they need instead is a parent to be aware of how the child may be feeling, even if the child doesn't know how to express it. So for a little one, you know, you may be able to 
you know, check in with um, using, you know, I, I call it connection time. Actually, connection time can be for every every age kid. It's just going to look different based on how old your kid is. So for a little one, you can do, you know, um, you can play games with them. You play dollhouse or you can, and each doll can represent different characters in their lives. You can um, ask them to draw pictures. You can use a lot of drawing as a way to help the child understand their emotions, name the emotions and put a color to it. And then let's draw a picture. And, you know, where do you feel that in your body? I think that using a lot of, you know, sort of sensory motor kind of exercises can be really helpful, especially, especially for little ones. And they then develop this inner landscape of, I know what I need. I know how to talk about my feelings even if it's just through a color for now. And then that helps them um, develop language as they grow older to realize that their needs and their feelings are valid because your their parent made space for them. Um, so I think, you know, giving parents those tools of how to do this, because often I find parents don't know how. They want to, but they don't know how. Mm -hmm. um, creating mindful moments is really wonderful. Um, I did that with my child all the way up, even now she's 12 and sometimes we'll walk to school and you know I just ask her to kind of you know be aware of the five senses. Mm -hmm. And this is just an easy one because kids are like, yeah, I see this, I smell this, I taste this, you know, I'm sensing this in in um in touch or, you know, and that can then move into um conversations around how are you feeling? How has this been for you? And to really know that, you know, the divorce process is over time. It isn't just a one-time thing where you talk to them and ask them if they have any questions when you tell them that we're getting divorced. You know, new experiences through their lives, let's say there's a move, is going to activate old, old thoughts or feelings or new ones about like, ah, oh, not another change. And so I think it's it's about following your child through their developmental stages and being attuned to where they are in that moment. And the fundamental, I think, is being with the, your child, wherever they are. Mm -hmm. But they can feel that calm presence. I, I think it, what you just ended with, right? Being present, being with your child is so critically important. And if we back up to what you said about these cables, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we are still so connected with our ex or soon to be ex, that we're in such conflict and tension, there's no way we can be present with our kids. And, and really, um, the things that you're talking about, connected times, mindful moments, offering spaces to talk about feelings can only happen in a space where our child feels like they don't have to take care of us, right? That, that we're not so conflicted or that they don't have to protect or defend their other parent, which I think you also mentioned is really, really important. Um, I want to underscore something else you said, just for our our listeners. Um, there's something that I call 100 small conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and really what that means is that anything worth talking about is worth talking about 100 times. Mm -hmm. yes. And what I'm hearing you say is the same is true for hard things like divorce, right? Because kids are growing up over time. Right? Their, their understanding of divorce, of relationships, of the co-parenting, it's going to change. And so you're saying, talk about it as frequently as you need to, as your child wants to, correct? Yes. And I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the words we use and how we talk about it makes all the difference. Um, shame comes from secrecy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at, er, earlier on, you know, at the beginning, I talked about this shame narrative. And I think it's important for parents and for, you know, anyone who works with parents and children to realize that one of the biggest things that can really help a child is to help them develop this internal sort of narrative that's based on empowerment and being seen and heard without having to take on any external shame narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's, that's also part of the burden, right? Is like how we talk about it. Um, so when we are constantly throughout like the hundred conversations, I love that, throughout their lives, just like, this is what, this is, this is normal. This is our two home family system. Talking about it 
openly in a positive and neutral way with other parents, with other co-parents, creating community around it where uh, children feel a sense of belonging and that it's, this is, this is normal. My, my, I have two homes and I have, you know, two bedrooms and I have two pets and I have, you know, whatever it is. And I noticed how effective that is with my daughter, actually, you know, early on, well, during the pandemic, I ended up, um, one of my colleagues, She's a colleague, but she's also a friend, and we both have children in the same class. And during the pandemic, we started to hang out a lot more, and I and the children started to talk about their shared experiences of having two homes. And they talked about like what was different, but what was the same. And they really relished and started to find a sense of pride within themselves and how they talked about it. Like, yeah, we have two homes and my mom, our moms are kind of similar. They're both therapists and, you know, our dads got remarried or have partners and, you know, well, it's a little different because now I have a sister and you don't, they were able to find connection and belonging because we created community for them. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, one time my daughter comes home and she's like, yeah, you know, today one of um, our classmates, you know, came up to us and was like, is it weird that you guys, you know, are from a divorced family? And they looked at each other like, no, this is normal. This is our life. This is our family. Mm-hmm. And I just was like, okay, you know, she has internalized this narrative that it's not bad, that it's not abnormal um, to be in two home family system. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, that was like a check, like whew, success, you know, and want to continue to nurture that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's really important is how we talk about it. These a hundred stories, these hundred moments constantly is really being aware of the ways that we relate what's going on with them and, mm-hmm. and with us in the situation they're in. Yeah. I mean, I want to reassure people as we're you know, talking about this, Arisha does this beautiful job in her book, really walking you through like what happens with attachment, how we create um, a little bit more stability during change processes, like normalizing the process, um, how to communicate with less conflict, how to present a united front, all of these things she beautifully lays out. So we're hitting on high points today that you might have a lot more questions about as you're listening. I encourage you to find a guide like cooperative co-parenting to walk you through this process so that you feel less alone too. Um, You know, there are times I think with divorce that as much as we try to normalize, there's also deep grief. Yes. How do you encourage parents to separate their deep grief, which is normal, from maybe deep grief that their child might be experiencing. As as much as we try to normalize a process, they might feel sad that, you know, both of their parents aren't living together, or maybe they miss their dog, or, you know, um, maybe they're having a hard time adjusting to a new partner in their other parent's life. Like, how do you encourage discussions and conversations around the grief process? I mean, I it's talk about it, make it be part of the normal conversation, validate your kids' feelings. Of course you miss your dog or you miss your other parent and not to personalize it. And I think that's a big thing is separating yourself out from your child. So, you know, I hear uh, parents sometimes like, oh, it hurts me so much when we're sitting there doing bedtime and they were like, I want daddy or I want mommy. And it's not the parent who's with them and they personalize it. They feel like, you know, what does this mean about me? Does this mean that the, my, my child doesn't like me or doesn't love me? And then it becomes more centered about them. And I think, you know, when I work with parents, it's really important to teach them to ask this question. Is this about me or is this about yeah, me? I love that. You know, and that can really help reframe like, you know what? This is not about me. This is my child telling me that they love their other parent. And that's where you're like, of course you love your other parent. Of course you miss them. They're not here right now. And you're thinking about them right now. We both love you. And that's, and then going back to kind of just reassuring that um, they have a safe parent to talk about their feelings within that moment. And that it's not going to cause any uh, dysregulation in the parent who's hearing it at that moment. Mm -hmm. And just Mm -hmm. to stay again, be that guide, be that present, attuned, um, reflective, parent who doesn't try to fix or change or judge the child's feelings. Mm -hmm. So that question is really a key one. Is this about me or is this about my child? It's about your child 90% of the time and behaviors, 
you know, this is also a big thing. Like my child's acting out, they're pitting us against each other. You know, they're saying that I'm, I'm mean and they like their dad better because they can play with their, you know, whatever, be on TV longer, whatever the thing is. Again, that is not about you. And it's not even about your co-parent. It's about the child probably expressing that they're struggling with the differences in rules, for example. Mm -hmm. um, or if a child is struggling with transitions and um, you know they're having meltdowns and they don't wanna go to their other parent's house, sometimes people can say, well, what's going on at the other parent's house? E, you know, is there something unsafe going on? Do they, you know, and, and they can work themselves up in this anxiety, whereas they're then forgetting that it's, this is actually your kid telling you they may need some more support and structure and connection during a transition because transitions cause anxiety, you know? And so, yeah, as you mentioned, my book, I go through process and you know, we can talk about it now if you want, like just how to help your child during those transition moments so that they feel grounded and connected, which will be sort of that bridge that you can help them with during these times that are separations and reunions. Mm -hmm. And again, those separations and reunions are what actually activates that internal attachment system where they're seeking more connection and safety and attunement and like let me know that you've got me mm -hmm. that I can you know rely on you to be present while I'm doing this hard thing which is going into a new a different environment from what I just was, was in right now yeah. Uh, for people that are listening that might be familiar with like circle of security training, right? It's that child coming back to you, right? Mm -hmm. Organize my feelings, support me, help me fe feel reassured and safe, right? And that's our job. Every time our child goes out into the world, you're going to do great. You're going to have a fun time. Enjoy your time with daddy or mommy, right? And when they come back in, I'm so excited to see you. How was it? Tell me if you'd like to. Don't tell me, right? Just like allowing space for your child to have their own process, I think is so critically important. Um, Can I add one thing there? Yeah. Um, the I miss you. Mm -hmm. mm. I think often what happens during a transition is parents feel their own feelings of sadness of like, yes. I'm not going to see my kid. I'm going to miss them. And they say, I'm going to miss you, which they, which is well-meaning. Mm -hmm. But what happens for some kids is that they take it on as, Oh, now my parent is going to struggle without me being there. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I shouldn't express any excitement for going to my other parent's house. Cause that's going to upset my parent right now. Who's struggling or having their own feelings of missing. Yep. So I, I usually tell parents to say, I love you instead of I miss you. Mm -hmm. I love you. And I'm so excited to see you in three days. Mm -hmm. Which again, is that's what they need. It's that internal blueprint, right? Kids, uh, parents can create this internal blueprint of safety and security. So the, I love you, even when you're not in my presence is like filling their cup up, their internal system of, I am with you. And I'm thinking about you all the time. Even when you're not here, you have me in you. And that, ah, it's such a relief for a kid where they can just feel that love without having to do anything to receive it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the clarification at 100%. I think you know, all kids are different too. Some kids get anxious knowing that when they're away from you, that you're doing other things, right? They have a little bit of FOMO, right? Like, well, what are you doing while I'm at my other parent's house? Um, and some kids really need the reassurance. Like, you know, I, I'll just use myself, you know, mom's fine. She's just doing her thing. And she, she, of course, thinks about me and loves it when I come back home. Um, so I think it's important to, to strike a balance um, with messaging for our kids. Um, absolutely. I want to shift a little bit um, to a delicate question, which is, you know, the importance of co-parenting and low conflict and having your child's emotional self at the center. I think you and I would agree is the most important part of this process. And as we both know, sometimes you're co-parenting with someone who is struggling with an addiction or has a personality disorder or is otherwise perhaps incapable of doing their side mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. What do you advise parents of who are just really struggling to, they're like, I'd love to do this. This sounds great. Um, how do I do it when I'm, you know, co-parenting with someone who 
and I don't want to ever villainize another parent, right? But maybe just doesn't have the capacity to do this. Like that. It doesn't have the capacity. Um, well, you know, as I say in my book, it it uh, you can do this without your co-parent on board because it really takes only one parent to create a secure environment and a secure attachment with the child. Um, and they can take that with them as they navigate to homes. So instead of being anxious about what the other parent is doing or not doing, um, which in a way just creates anxiety and friction and more conflict and turns you away from what actually is important, focus on what you can do. What am I doing um, that can, uh, what am I doing? What am I not doing? How am I contributing to this dynamic? Uh, and then shifting to what can I do in my own home? Cause you, have power and you have control over what you can do in your own home with your child and parent and be attuned to them in the way you want to. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, maintaining united front, you don't want to say anything negative about the other parent. You want your child to feel like they still can, you love both parents, even if you don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and stay focused on, you know, creating really beautiful quality moments um, with your child and this connection time and memories and bondings that you can have in your own home. That is enough to help your child develop true resiliency and security and confidence and a sense of secure, you know, safety if it's just happening in one home. And so that's yeah. what I usually tell parents is like, focus on you and what you can do, not on what the your co-parent is or isn't doing. Yeah, friends, I really want you to hear what Arisha's saying. Um, we cannot impose a practice on another person, right? We can only do it ourselves. And, you know, I know we all learn through stories and, and I'll just share Arisha, you know, when I was going through a separation process with my ex, I remember tucking one of my kids into bed. Um, I, I won't mention who necessarily that's their story to tell, but, um, and I was saying like, it sounds like things were so fun at daddy's. He is a really fun person. He's super playful and, you know, he's so great at like vacations and playing and, you know, pools. And, and my child said, um, mommy, why do you say all these nice things about him? He never says nice things about you. And that normal human part of me was like, what? <laughs> I can't believe that. Right. But the grounded part of me that wanted to just be there for my kids, right? So I'm thinking about your cables, right? The cables that were no longer attached to my ex. I was able, because of that, to refocus and say, I'm sorry. That might hurt your heart mm -hmm. to hear things about me that aren't great. Um, and then I just said, you know, I'm happy to listen to you. I'm happy to hold your heart. I'm happy to be here with you. And I still think your daddy's a good person. Mm -hmm. I want to just validate for people that might be listening. It does, does not mean that that wasn't hard for me to do, right? I am an adult human being with my own thoughts and feelings. And it was really hard. But what's even harder, what I want listeners to hear, what's even harder is if I were to have turned that and said, well, you know what? Your dad's actually a jerk too. I don't know why I've been saying all these nice things about him all along. And what is he saying about me? Tell me right now, which I think is a human protective response. But then if we, if we use your analogy from before, what we're doing is we're just putting more weight in the backpack. Yeah. And my goal in that moment, at least with my kid was like, let me carry the backpack for just a minute. That feels heavy for you. Yeah. I'm sorry that that's happening without villainizing, without, right? And so I just wanted to share that story because sometimes the co-parenting, as much as we want to, is hard. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and I, I think if you read Arisha's book, I don't think she is all rainbows and butterflies um, about it. I think it's, you tell really beautiful stories and give practical ideas around co-parenting with an incredible co-parent and co-parenting, even if you're just, it's feeling a bit one-sided. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that, um, that story you told, I think can resonate with a lot of people of like, you know, the, the child is just acknowledging 
that they're noticing the differences. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you can just hold space for it. Yeah, people people talk about each other in different ways. Mm-hmm. Even if it's, you know, I love how you responded. And if you don't necessarily have all that, you know, you're right. a you the wherewithal. <laughs> it's just to acknowledge, yeah, there are differences. And, you know, and then going back to how is that for you to hear that, mm-hmm. to notice those differences? And that allows your child to, you know, get back to themselves of like, well, okay, there are differences in how people navigate, how people talk, how people. Mm-hmm. And so that also helps them to develop more of this like flexibility of thought. Yeah. Critical thinking skills, which, you know, as your kid gets older, they're going to apply that in their lives. Mm-hmm. You know, so the ways that we talk about the differences between um, the homes and the parents and the things we do and the ways we talk, all of that helps them make sense of the world around them. Mm-hmm. And if you can help them, you know, understand this in a way that's neutral and non, you know, obviously not biased or not continuing to put them in the middle by like what you said, like, you know, well, your dad doesn't know and trying to correct it or trying to change the narrative. You can just help your kid kind of like with the realities of that there are going to be some people who say this and there are going to be some people who do that. And, you know, this is, this is, this is the world as, as, Mm -hmm. as it's real. So when we can, and I say walk beside and walk with our children and hold space for them to understand these differences, um, they can apply that in the, in the world around them. And they know they can like rely on you to bounce ideas from Mm -hmm. like, what's this about? Or this is making me feel uncomfortable or what does this mean? Does this mean anything about me? You know, and reassuring them, then they're like, okay. And they're filled back up and they can, you know, get rid of that burden that's in their backpack, the confusion. um, And they can get back to being kids and learning and growing and understanding the world around them. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that walking alongside them. Um, well, we're kind of coming to the end of our time together. I have just a few um, kind of question bursts here for you at the end. Um, the first one is, what's one thing that people get wrong about co-parenting? I think one thing that people is the stigma that divorce hurts kids and it's not necessarily the divorce that hurts kids and that we have to change our co-parent in order for our system to be secure and that we instead we can do it ourselves and that we have the you know empowerment to do it if we want to in our own homes and your child can still be secure and thrive in a two home family system. I love uh, that. Yeah, and my whole last chapter actually talks about silver linings mm-hmm. because there really are, you know, as you know, through my research and talking to people, you just see this in the kids and how they're able to you know, bring in their self-awareness and their empathy because they went through something hard. They had a parent there with them and now they can empathize when someone else is going through something hard. That's an example. So yeah, necessarily have to cause trauma. It's how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree as a trauma expert. Um, Tell me one thing in your life that's just giving you magic and hope that feels life-giving for you professionally or personally. So something that I've been with right now is being in the flow. Mm -hmm. So anytime I feel anxiety about something or about the book or, you know, things in my life, I'm just bringing myself back to this image of being on a stream and being in the flow and being connected to, you know, the, the sky and the earth. And it's so grounding. And I feel like that's kind of like bringing me a lot of energy and focus as, you know, there are so many things going on around. And so that's kind of, I've been excited about, you know, talking about it or like noticing how helpful that is, <laughs> that that idea of just being in the flow. Yeah, I like that. Um, for those of you that are watching on YouTube who are better like active listeners watching versus listening on a, on earbuds or whatnot, Arisha has like this beautiful green plant behind her and her cat has come in and out of the space. And so it really is kind of, practicing grounding and being present with. I love that. Um, The last thing, not a hard question at all, but I ask all of my guests, um, it's 10 or 11 o'clock at night and you have a food craving. What do you reach for? Dried mango. Oh my gosh. Favorite. Everyone who knows me always, when we go on trips or whatever brings, I always have some dried mango with me and almonds. Those are the two. 
Love that. Oh my gosh. We, we are, we could be travel buddies. Cause that's one of my favorite snacks too. dried fruit and nuts, like all day, all day. <laughs> um, Arisha, where is the best place people can find you? And then I'll link to everything in our show notes as well. So you can go to my website, which is arishasmolarski.com. Um, you can find me on Instagram, which is at cooperative co-parenting or Facebook, same thing, cooperative co-parenting. And you feel free to email me um, or DM me and I'd be happy to chat with anyone. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say um, I think more information and books like this need to be out there for children and families. Um, this is something we can do that on the other side, kids can come out as stronger, safer, resilient, connected children. So thank you so much for putting that work into the world. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Amy. This has been such a pleasure talking with you.